that means the one who, who the one who corrupt all right i'm live i am live hey hi i am live let's do this guys hold on i should be live hey guys can you see me i'm gonna go in the butter room i'm just trying to figure this out it's been a long time folks hey how you doing idiot die apologetics <laughs> Nice name. Sorry, man. I'm in the dark. Is this recording, by the way? I'm thinking it's recording. All right, folks. I'm live. My first live stream in about, what, almost a year? Okay, guys. What's up, man? What's up? What's up? And tell people I'm here. Sorry for the delay. This is as good as it's going to get. I'm trying to brighten up the room. Ooh, child. Is it all right? Or is it too dark still? Let's see, man. Oh, man. Sorry. This is all I can do, friend. Is it too dark or is it all right? Yo, let me share the link. All right, let me tell. Let me just let people know I'm live. It's hard, folks. It's a prehistoric computer. The newer computer I got broke. So pray for me by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm planning to start live streaming more often if the Lord Jesus permits by the power of his Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. I'm just letting people know I'm on. One second, folks. Yeah, I'm just going to give you a brief update on my situation. I hope the lighting isn't bad. This is as good as it gets. Let's see. Can we do it? Yeah. Yeah, man, the lighting is bad. Let's see if we go over here. Yeah, I think it's better here. How about the lighting now? Is it too bright? Yeah, it's too bright. Hold on. Hey man, don't 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 hate. I'm looking fit. Right? Don't hate, man. Don't hate. Is it too bright? Or is it perfect? Is the light bothering you guys? Or is this perfect? Perfecto. All right. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you fill us with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Cover us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Sanctify us for your glory, Father. Anoint me, Father. Anoint my mouth, <clears throat> my mind, by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak truth without error. Protect me from stammering and confusion. And fill me with the Spirit to bless your people. They're not here for me, Father. They're here <clears throat> to receive words from you for the glory of Jesus, your beloved Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting the Spirit will use me for the glory of Jesus Christ. And we want to say we love you, Father. Please forgive us. Please be patient with us. And please transform us by your Spirit to become more like Jesus and to trust in you, <clears throat> to cleave to the cross of Jesus Christ and to be sealed by your Spirit. And, Father, bless our loved ones, in my case, my daughters and their mother, and cover us by the blood of Jesus. Have your way tonight and use me to bless your people, to glorify your Son. We love you. We worship you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Welcome, folks. We're on. Since it's my first time doing a live, what is it, live stream now? It says webcam, man. I even forgot what to call it. I'm going to open up for Q&A unless the Spirit leads me to discuss a particular topic because there are a million and one things we can discuss, and I want to get back into the saddle and be used of the Lord Jesus to start teaching again for the majesty of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I see a lot of people that I haven't seen in a, a, a long time. First and last, welcome. Don't mind the background. Lord willing, in time, I will try to find a more suitable place where the lighting will be much better, the quality will be better. But you know what? Where it's not so much the lighting the quality of the room as it is the quality of the teaching by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Manchester, I thought I sent you links to that. In the comment section, I sent you links dealing with 1 Samuel 15 and the slaughter of the Amalekites, right? So pray for us, pray for me to be spirit-filled. Just to give you a little update, a brief update. I can't go into too many details right now because there are some issues that I have to be sensitive to what I say because there are other parties involved. But for the past year, 
Satan brought a major trial and attack upon my family and it's going to be public if it's not already public but again um, I'm now officially divorced Satan came in and attacked my family and I'm still waiting for deliverance from this situation so that I can be completely free to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ on my daughters my angels to raise them up in the love of Christ and on ministry so keep praying for me because there are some financial issues and tribulations that still face me and I need the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver me from those financial issues in fact prayerfully consider if you want to partner with this ministry and support the ministry so that I can continue to be used of God for the glory of Jesus Christ and I've said it and I'll say it again the Lord doesn't need me doesn't need me in ministry because it's not about ministry it's about worshiping Jesus Christ it's about loving Jesus Christ and being loved by him and serving him in any capacity in any position but as many of you know the Lord Jesus Christ called me into full-time ministry in 1999 and it's all I've been doing since 1999 imperfectly so <clears throat> I've had my ups and downs and even the greatest saints can be the worst of sinners and each apologist theologian all of us have clay feet because only Jesus Christ is the perfect man because he's God in the flesh he will never fail us he will never disappoint us he is the same yesterday today and forever and so we look to Jesus Christ we love the servants that God uses for his glory in the power of the Holy Spirit but we do not idolize or elevate any human being and make him more than he or she deserves to be made because everything good and perfect comes from the triune God it comes from Jesus Christ and we cannot love our God enough so I will fail you and I will disappoint you but Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior never will fail you can never disappoint you he's God Almighty so as much as you love me don't love me too much and don't love me too little and if I if I fall don't be the first to pick up a stone to stone me even though I deserve it but pray for my restoration and pray for <clears throat> the Holy Spirit to seal me for the glory of Jesus Christ and fill me for the glory of Jesus Christ and to make me more like Jesus Christ and pray that for yourselves as well because Jesus Christ is worthy and pray that for all the other apologists and theologians because Satan comes after those who are in the front lines he wants to discredit them he wants to attack them he wants them to stumble to bring great shame to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right so I hope that's clear well uh, Tatiana thank you sister you said you're a Syrian praise the Lord Jesus Christ that there's an Assyrian sister who loves Jesus Christ right because Christ came to save all nations including my own people but Tatiana, to be honest with you, it's 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 pretty much done. I mean, unless God does something miraculous and shows me in a miraculous way, it's pretty much done, right? In in the future, I'll be more open and public about why I ended up divorced. You know, I don't want to come off as slandering her or putting her down, but there was an issue of unfaithfulness. And so pray that the Lord Jesus will have mercy on us will forgive her forgive me for my shortcomings and protect my children for the glory of Jesus Christ right yeah so with that said I do need another thing for you to pray about ask the Lord Jesus to show me in a way that it will be clear as day and no doubt that he wants me to continue to serve him in ministry and not step away and that the Lord Jesus will give me the health and the holiness I need to do it and provide for me. So ask, ask the Lord specifically for that because I'm at a crossroad right now. I still believe Christ wants me to serve him in ministry. But again, like I said, his will be done as long as I'm able to love Jesus and raise up my daughters for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay, now with that said, that's how you can pray for me <clears throat> and for my children as well as their mother. Pray for the support, right? that it keeps coming in on a regular basis so I can continue to do the ministry and serve my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and for a miraculous verdict, miraculous deliverance, a verdict that will be a blessing to me and my children. But now with that said, let's talk about the Lord Jesus. Let's talk about Christian <clears throat> doctrines. Let's talk about scripture. Let's talk about the cults. Let's talk about Islam. I'm here to serve you if you have any questions. Idiotai says, are we still friends? Who said? We were ever friends. <laughs> Look at this guy. Talk about being, uh, this guy thinks he knows me. <laughs> he knows me. <laughs> All right. Anyway, 
What is Tawheed? Be more specific. What are you asking me about Tawheed? Or what, are you, what are you getting at? Specifically, are you asking me how Muslims define the term Tawheed? Is that what you're asking me? Well, Tawheed, according to Muslims, Muslim scholars, theologians, apologists, refers to not monotheism, right? As the Lord Jesus grants me unction, anoints me by the Spirit to speak truth without error. Not monotheism, but Unitarianism, right? Yeah, and that's another thing. Trinity versus Tawheed, that would be an appropriate title for a debate. And an inappropriate title for a debate is to say Trinity versus monotheism. I've seen some Christians engage in the proposition Trinity versus monotheism as if the Trinity is not monotheistic. Do not agree to such titles and do not agree to such propositions when it comes to debating Muslims. Because if you agree with that title, that, that proposition statement, Trinity versus monotheism, what you're basically admitting to is that the Trinity is not monotheistic. That the Trinity is a diversion, an aberration, a perversion of monotheism. Because what does monotheism teach? Monotheism teaches there's only one eternal God, one God who is eternal, beginningless, timeless, all-powerful, all-knowing, <clears throat> present everywhere, because the entire creation is present before him, right? <clears throat> And possesses a plurality of attributes that are perfect. And he lacks nothing and needs no one, right? There's only one God in that sense. There is no other God. <clears throat> there aren't multiple gods that are beginningless, all-powerful, all-knowing, etc. There's only one God in that sense. And I keep saying in that sense because I'm sure that many of you are aware that there's a now a growing trend among professing evangelical Christians to affirm what is known as the divine council, what I call the divine council motif. And it's been made popular by Mike Heiser, Michael Heiser, who I consider to be a dear Christian brother, a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ and a top-notch scholar. But like all scholars, including myself, I'm not saying I'm a scholar, like all scholars and apologists, he's fallible, he's mistaken, like I am, like James White is, like Michael Brown is, because none of us have perfect understanding of the scriptures. None of us are perfect in our theology, especially in our daily walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are being perfected, and in many areas, <clears throat> we are lacking the understanding and the wisdom <clears throat> in regards to specific topics <clears throat> taught in the scriptures. So I just want to be clear that Mike Kaiser is an outstanding scholar, a top-notch scholar who loves Jesus Christ. He's a Trinitarian. And I agree with a lot of his viewpoints, but there are things he says I don't agree with. And that's that's a given. Not everyone agrees with everything I teach, not everything I espouse. But here's the thing, though. I want you to pay attention. I'm the closest thing to perfect theology. So the more you agree with me, the more certainty you will have that your theology is sound. I just want you to know that. Okay? Closest. <laughs> All right. Let's put that aside. Uh, I'm still stuck on the devil attacking. Yeah, I know Tatiana. Tatiana, my niece's name is Tatiana. By the way, if you want, befriend me on Facebook and follow me on Facebook, right? You'll see a picture of my daughters on my Facebook page, and there are other pages started by Christian brothers and sisters and their love and support for me that I manage. So look for Sam Shamoon, S-H-A-M-O-U-N. Uh, how about we debate about what? What are you guys talking about? Are we get, are we getting into like some side issues here where brothers are fighting and debating? We could get one-on-one -on, -one on Skype. I have no idea. Idiota, who are you talking to about debating? Okay. What do I think about James White? He's got a lot of great material. He's very knowledgeable. He's been used of the Lord Jesus Christ mightily, but he's also got – some serious, how do I say this? Because I'm sure many of you are aware that we've had a feud in the past and I'm trying to bury the hatchet and extend an olive branch to the brother because he's a brother in Jesus Christ and I want to seek for unity <clears throat> that's based on the foundation of God's truth, the Holy Scriptures, not a unity that compromises the truth of God. And he is a brother of Christ, a brother in Christ. He's a brother 
in the Lord Jesus. He's used of God mightily. But there are things I disagree with him, especially on some of the things he has to say about Islam. But he's still a brother in Jesus Christ. I actually extended a debate challenge to Muhammad Ijab a while back. The fact of the matter, folks, is they won't debate me. Uh, the reason why they won't debate me is because, let me just be honest, I don't want you to think that I'm coming off as, as I think I'm God's gift to apologetics to Muslims. No, I'm not. Jesus doesn't need me. I need him. Any gift, any, any blessing, any grace, anything good that comes from me, he is the source of it. He gets the glory. But the fact is, they're scared of me. That's the fact. And this is not just me saying it. You can ask all the other apologists. You can ask David Wood. You can ask Anthony Rogers. You can ask all the other apologists. The Muslims fear me. They won't debate me. So what they do is they try to come up with this excuse that I'm too harsh. I'm not loving. I'm not kind. And it's ironic that Muslims would complain about me being harsh in light of the disrespect that Muhammad Hijab showed towards David Wood, who was anything, right? <clears throat> I mean, David Wood was the epitome of patience, love, and self-control, and that's because the Holy Spirit constrained them for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? How do I evaluate Wood in front of Hijab? I, I thought, if you look, if you put aside the tap dance and you put aside the rhetoric and you put aside the shouting, David Wood actually destroyed Muhammad Hijab. If you pay attention to the content, don't get swayed by the rhetoric. Don't get swayed by the showmanship. Don't get swayed with, with the arrogance and the confidence. That was all a facade. That was all a facade. Muhammad Hijab knew that he got pulverized by the force of, of the arguments of David Wood. So he had to resort to theatrics like first and last stated. He had to resort to showmanship and bravado because he knew he had nothing by way of response. He knew David Wood pulverized them by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. The only problem is when you're dealing with Muslims for the most part, now there are Muslims who are Western educated. So they try to put on the mannerism, the demeanor of Westerners. In Western academia, the louder you are, the more of a turnoff you become, right? Because in Western academics, they want to see someone who's well-reserved, controlled, and usually monotone, right? This is what appeals to Western audiences. When you're dealing with Middle Eastern people or Eastern people, especially Muslims, they love fire, they love passion, they love in your face. Right. The more passionate you are to them, that's a sign that you have absolute confidence in the truthfulness of your position. So they equate truth with passion, with might, because to them, might means right. Right. In their mindset. So that's why so many Muslims thought that Muhammad Hijab won. And even Christians were not Westerners. Right. And there were a few Westerners that surprised me that they thought Muhammad Hijab actually won. And I think the reason why they thought he won is because they didn't know Arabic. And so they were deceived by Muhammad Ajab's appeal to Arabic and the fact that David Wood doesn't know Arabic, right? Because those who know Arabic, right, and know, know Islam and just look beyond the facade and the bravado, David Wood obliterated him. In fact, what else do you want? What more do you want, I should say, than Muhammad Hijab admitting, admitting that Allah prays for Muhammad, right? You guys remember that? He admitted it. And that was precisely David Wood's point. Who does Allah pray to when he prays for Muhammad? See, I knew, I knew I'd have to give you a free Arabic lesson. Allah doesn't pray to Muhammad. What are you talking about, man? 20 years? He prays for, right? Salah Allah doesn't even pray to. Doesn't say lahu. And he made... David Wood's point. He admitted to Muslims his God prays. Guys, what else do you want? That was golden. But then he said something else. I don't know if you caught it. Then he said something else. I don't know if you caught it. He even said that Salah is dua. Go back and listen to the debate. 
Salla is dua. Okay, now sa'al no, he called it dua. According to so, so called authentic narrations attributed to Muhammad, sound narrations, Muhammad is reported to have said, watch here, dua is the essence of ibadah. Now, let me define these Arabic terms. Dua is invocation when you invoke, right? You supplicate. Is the essence of worship. Dua is the essence of ibadah. In other words, what is worship if not invocation? That's what Muhammad is reported to have said. And I've written articles on this. I've done shows on this. Lord Jesus willing, I'll, I'll post the links later. You understand what that means, right? Guys, you understand? By him saying that salah means dua. Salah is the Arabic word for prayer. Prayer is invocation. He just admits his God worships because he admitted Allah prays for. Okay, but wait, if Allah prays for Muhammad and prayer, salah, is invocation, and Muhammad says invocation is the essence of worship, thank you, Muhammad Hijab, for admitting that your God worships. But who does he worship? A question he never answered. A question that he never answered. You see how embarrassing that was? Real quickly, let me just post this link on... I think I posted it here. So that debate was golden. Muhammad Hijab greatly damaged Islam. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and went beyond the bravado and the facade and the showmanship, the tap dance, he made assertions, statements that end up destroying Islam and more specifically, Tawheed. Glory to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus for that debate. One of the most humiliating debates for Muslims, right? So those people who think that David would lost, what are you talking about? How did he lose? Tell me. What did he say that Muhammad Hijab refuted? And what did Muhammad Hijab say that David Wood did not refute by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Point to one argument. Here, those of you who watched the debate who thought that David Wood didn't do well, I'm not saying you do. If you did, Give me an argument that David Wood made that Muhammad Hijab refuted or an argument that Muhammad Hijab made that David Wood didn't thoroughly address in the time allotted to him. Can you mention one? Go ahead. I'm here. Okay. Now, besides that, any other questions? Someone's asking me about Malachi 3.1, Zechariah 12.10. What's the Muslim reaction to that? Well, Malachi threw on, they really don't have a reaction to it. Will you, do, will you be doing another debate with black Hebrew Israelites? If they'll debate me, I don't mind. Look, I'm willing to debate any of the occultists, right, on the core doctrines of the Christian faith, right? So you have to ask them, not me. Anyway, someone asked me a question, and Lord Jesus willing, we'll get into the questions. Now, invite people in. Uh, actually, I want to see a lot more people come in. Keep praying for me to get healthier and to be holier, and that the Lord will sustain me and my children for the glory of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Someone just asked me a good question. Someone just asked me, what do Muslims do with Malachi 3 and Zechariah 12.10? Zechariah 12.10 can be a problem if you're not aware of the variant readings among the extent Hebrew manuscripts, even though the predominant reading, the majority reading is, they shall look on me whom they pierced. Illi whom they pierced, right? There are some manuscripts that say they shall look on him whom they pierce. So if you go with the reading that says they shall look on him whom they pierce, it's not an explicit testimony to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, the majority of Hebrew manuscripts and even some of the versions testify the reading is they shall look on me whom they pierce, Zechariah 12.10. And God is the one speaking, so the one they're piercing is God. A powerful testimony to God becoming flesh because you cannot pierce a spirit and yet the verb for pierce is used elsewhere in the hebrew bible for being pierced through thrust through with a sword right so it's a physical piercing how do you physically pierce god who is spirit if god doesn't become flesh so it's a testimony that god will become flesh and will be pierced through physically 
And it's also a testimony to the two advents of the Messiah, because it says that they will realize when he comes to fight for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, their great sin in piercing him. Well, that means he, he must have been there prior to that event, right? A time in which they actually did the piercing. So this assumes the two advents of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Zechariah 12.10. But I would imagine and envision they would try to get around it due to the fact that there is a variant reading, even though it's in the minority of manuscripts, the majority read, they shall look on me whom they pierced. And in fact, there are some English translations that render it as they shall look on him, right? On the one whom they have pierced, Zechariah 12.10. In fact, let me do that. Let me let me call some Bible verses. Now I'm gonna again. I'm working my way around the technology, so it's gonna take me a few few times more where I get adjusted, in which I can share my screen and you can see Bible verses instead of seeing a a very you know <laughs> not too well lit room. But let my good looks at least capture you, and don't hate, just participate. Here, we're going to look at Zechariah 12.10. Go to BibleGateway.com for those of you who want to follow me. Go to BibleGateway.com for those of you who want to follow me and the reading. And what you do is you put in Zechariah 12.10, right? I'll give you the link if I can. Zechariah 12.10. It gives you a feature at the bottom of the passage. If you, if you go there, BibleGateway.com, and you put in Zechariah 12.10, it says Zechariah 12.10 in all English translations. And I'm going to share the link here with you guys. Hold on. So that you can go there and check it out for yourself. Okay. Right here. Here goes the link. Okay. Click on that link. Click on that link. Now, for the brother who asked me the question, I want you to scroll down to the new Revised Standard Version and the Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> Notice how these translations render... Zechariah 12.10. Here's the New Revised Standard Version. And I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that when they look on the one whom they pierced. Did you catch it? So that when they look on the one whom they pierced, they shall mourn for him, for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now, Revised Standard Version. And I'll pour out on the house of David, inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of compassion and supplication, so that when they look on him whom they appear, they shall mourn for him. So here in these translations, it's look on the one or look on him, not look on me. Now let's go to the authorized version. The king ain't on it. The king ain't in it. The King James Bible. The authorized version. And I'll pour, out, pour upon the house of David. And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And this is the reading of the majority of the Hebrew manuscripts, right? As well as some ancient versions. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now let's look at modern English version, which is supposed to be modernized King James. The King James translation and modern English. MEV, modern English version. And I will pour out on the house of David and over those dwelling in Jerusalem a spirit of favor and supplication so that they look to me whom they have pierced through. So that's how a Muslim would try to get around the reading, this passage. They'd argue that it doesn't say they pierce God. Look on me, God speaking, the one they pierce. But it says they will look to the one. To him whom they pierce, someone distinct, different from God. There are so many Sam Shimon. Well, the Sam Shimon that you're going to see, that's me, as a picture of my two daughters. That's my personal page. And then there is several pages started by some Christian brothers out of their love and respect for me that I'm now managing. One is called Sam Shimon where you see a picture of me. So just befriend me and I'll accept your, your friendship. Tatiana. Anyway, someone else. Mention Isaiah 48, 16. I'll get to that in a moment. But then you mentioned Malachi 3, 1. Malachi 3, 1. Brother, can, can you repeat that question again? Because I want to remember who it was. Malachi 3, 1. Idiota, who said we're friends in life for you to be my friend on Facebook? Anyway, someone asked me about Malachi 3, 1 and Zechariah 12, 1. Malachi 3, 1 is quite powerful. 
Okay? It's powerful. Okay? Let's read it. You guys want me to unpack Malachi 3? Yeah, RK. Okay, now I'm going to remember you. Malachi 3.1. It's powerful. Malachi 3.1. Let's read it. Malachi 3.1. Remember, I can't share the screen right now because I'm still learning, you know, figuring out how to work this technology. In time, I'm going to be a master of this. If you're praying that the Lord Jesus confirms to me to stay in ministry and provide for me and grant me a miraculous deliverance with a verdict that will be a blessing to my children and I, because I'm still not out of the fire, but the blood of Jesus Christ covers me and my children to save us from being <clears throat> burnt by the fire. This fire is going to purge us to be more like Jesus. It will not consume us because the blood of Jesus <clears throat> Cleanses us. Anyway, Malachi 3.1. Let's unpack it. Let me tell you why this passage is powerful. Malachi 3.1. Okay? Just let's, let's real quickly. I'm going to read from the authorized version. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Notice, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. I want you to pay attention to this. Whoever this Lord is, he's coming to his temple. Which temple? The temple built in Jerusalem, which was built for the worship of the one true God. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's unpack this. Number one, I want you to notice that the, pro the passage prophesied or prophesies a messenger sent to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Side note, the word for messenger in Hebrew is malach. In Greek, malach is rendered as angelos. The word malach in Hebrew and angelos in Greek is the word from which we get angel. Here's this guy trying to hit on my Assyrian sister. He goes, you're quite beautiful, sister. Rambo owes me money. I don't know if I'm going to send him on his merry way. We'll see. Anyway, this is something from every for every one of you to recall and use in your witness. The word angel in the Bible, the term angel in the Bible does not necessarily refer to a spirit creature. Secondly, Every time and any time the word angel is used in reference to an emissary, an envoy of God, a servant of God, you'll never find that angel described as someone who has wings. Everyone with me there? Oh, my goodness. You got a heretic here. Hold on. Hold on. First and last, I want to add you as a moderator to keep an eye on the room. I forgot I can make people moderators. Okay? You're already a mo moderator, right? Yeah, you are. Okay. I'll probably make Chris Claus one too. Okay. Just keep an eye on some of these heretics, right? All right. Coming back to the issue. The word malach and the Greek word, that's Hebrew, Greek, angelos, is the word which, which we get angel from. In the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. Yes, I'll, um, hold on one second, brother. Old Testament, New Testament, right? When you see the word angel used in reference to an envoy, an emissary of God, you'll never find that angel described as a being with wings. Did you know that? Did you know that? Some of you already knew this. Some of you may not know this. Because when I say angel... Typically, the first image in your mind is a spirit creature with wings. Spirit creature with wings. Erase that from your mind. Erase that from your mind. Spirit creature with wings. The term simply means messenger. Now, depending on the context, depending on the context, that angel can be a human envoy or a messenger sent from heaven, a spiritual envoy. Sent from God's presence in heaven to the earth. Now, here's what's interesting. There is one particular angel, Malach Angelos, who appears in the Old Testament quite often, who is a spirit being from heaven, who oftentimes appears 
as a man in human form, but he's not a creature. He's not a creature. Do you know that? It's not a creature. This particular angel is actually God Almighty appearing in human form as the envoy, the apostle, the emissary of God. So you have an angel appearing from heaven on earth, oftentimes in human form, who is God, yet distinct from God. Because he's the messenger of God, sent by God to speak on God's behalf, and yet he happens to be God. Do you know that? That angel becomes Jesus Christ our Lord. That angel becomes Jesus Christ our Lord. This is why in the Old Testament, this angel often appears. He's worshipped as God. He calls himself God. God glorifies him as God, right? <clears throat> and yet when it comes to the New Testament, you do not find that angel anymore. Actually, you do, but under a different identity. Because the angels of the New Testament, whether heavenly or earthly, refuse to accept worship and never identify themselves as God. And God never glorifies them as God. Okay, let me prove it. Are you guys ready? I'm going to give you references. Do you remember in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10? And Revelation 22, 8 to 9? The angel sent by the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord to give John these revelations in the power of the Holy Spirit. When John, from the glorious appearance of the angel, fell down to worship at his feet, that angel says, do not do it. Revelation 19, verse 10, 22, 8 to 9. He says, do not do it. And notice what he says. I'm a fellow slave, a fellow servant with you and your brothers, your, your brothers, the prophets, who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Then he says, worship God. So the angels in the New Testament, because they're merely creatures, do not accept worship as God, do not call themselves God, and God doesn't glorify them as God. But that angel in the Old Testament is worshipped as God, is glorified as God, calls himself God, and God glorifies him as God. What happened to that angel? Why did he disappear in the New Testament? He didn't disappear. He took on a human identity. That angel is now known as the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now, you with me so far before I move on? Everyone with me so far before I move on? Because I want to unpack Malachi 3.1 for the benefit of every one of you. Okay. Coming back to Malachi 3.1. So an angel will be sent. A messenger will be sent who is a human angel, a human messenger, to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Now, if you have your Bibles in front of you, I want you to open up to Malachi 3.1. Let me give you the link. You can read it with me. Typically, usually I have people read for me. Makes it easier for me, but it's okay. Okay, Eli, where are you lost? I'll take my time to unpack this point for you. No, I'm not talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. I was asked, what would a Muslim do? How would a Muslim react to the use of Malachi 3.1? No, Melchizedek is not Jesus. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. He's a picture of Christ to come. That's what Hebrews 7.3 says. If you look at the word, it says resembling, made like the Son of God, aphamoyo. If he resembles the Son of God and he's made like the Son of God, that means he's not the Son of God, but he's a picture of the Son of God. And if you want my article on that, I'll send it to you. There are people who believe it is Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence, but you're going to find it quite difficult to get around the word aphamoyo. I'm not trying to impress you with Greek. I'm not a Greek scholar, but the word is resembling the Son of God, made like the Son of God. Melchizedek was deliberately depicted as an eternal being, not because he's actually eternal, because he's a foreshadowing, a picture of the one who is eternal. He becomes a picture of a greater reality, that greater reality being the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Eli, let me repeat my definition, explanation of angel. The word angel simply means messenger. You have human angels, meaning human messengers, and you have heavenly messengers, heavenly angels. Heavenly angels, all of them are created with the exception of one. It is, there is one particular angel who's not a creature because he's the eternal son, God Almighty, the uncreated son, 
who takes on the role of a messenger angel on behalf of the Father. He alone among all these angels, whether heavenly or earthly, all the rest of them are creatures. Earthly messengers, angels, they're creatures. Heavenly messengers, angels, they're creatures with the exception of one. Jesus Christ, the eternal son who's not created, he is the angel of God in the Old Testament, who's not a creature, but the messenger of the Father, sent by the Father to reveal God to the Old Testament saints. Yeah, I'll do that, idiota. That's easy. I've done that before. I seen you comment. Praise the Lord, man. Yeah, I, I like a lot of Stephen Anderson stuff. But remember I said in the beginning, not every preacher, teacher has perfect theology. Definitely not me, even though I'm the closest thing to perfection. <laughs> okay, Eddie, you're still not getting it. If I have to repeat myself, that means you're not listening. You made up your mind. Jesus is an angel who is God. Stop arguing with me because you didn't get the point. In fact, I'm going to prove you didn't get the point. What does angel mean? Idi, let me see if you're paying attention. What does angel mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, him being King James only doesn't bother me. What bothers me is his very harsh, ungracious attitude towards homosexuals because he believes if you're homosexual, you cannot be converted and be saved. That's extreme. That's not true. I don't share that conviction. Another problem I have with him is that he believes that Jesus actually went to hell in his soul, to the lake of fire. He actually went there as part of the price he had to pay for our redemption. Yep, that's what he believes. But anyway, coming back to this, okay. Eli, messenger, right? Now, do you believe the Father sent Jesus into the world to preach the message of the Father? Eli or Eli? Uh, Brandon, do yourself a favor. Stop trying to parrot Stephen Anderson and appeal to Jonah to prove your point because Jonah is similar to Jesus in many ways, but quite dissimilar to him in many other ways. So don't pick those parts that you like about Jonah as being similar to the experience of Jesus in order to prove your blasphemous doctrine that Jesus burned in hell. Okay, now coming back to the issue, coming back to the issue, Edie. Jesus was sent with the Father's message, right? Doesn't that mean he's the messenger of the Father, Eli or Eli? No, it doesn't compare Jesus to Jonah in hell because you just denied that Jonah's in hell. You said he's in the, the belly of the whale, right? So you're saying the belly of the whale is hell? Make up your mind, Brandon. Okay, I just want to get the... It is okay. So now, if Jesus is the messenger of the Father, guess what, Edi? You just said he's the angel of the Father because the word angel means messenger. Okay, Brandon, you're not paying attention, are you? Nowhere does it say that he's in hell there. You take being in the heart of the earth, meaning hell, because like Anderson, you naively assume that hell is actually located, right, in the heart of the earth. That's your problem, not ours. Don't impose your gross misreading of the Bible upon us. Secondly, you do not believe Jonas was in hell, do you? Was Jonas in hell? Answer quickly, Brandon, because you're wasting my time and you're testing my patience. Was Jonas in hell? No, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. But you just said, Jonas is an analogy to Christ, and Jonas obviously suffered, so Jesus had to suffer. But you just agreed with me. Here's a stark difference between Jonas and Jesus. Because you don't believe Jonas went to hell, but you believe Jesus went to hell. So that means Jonas is not identical to what Jesus went through. So don't just conveniently pick those parts that you like to confirm your doctrine that Jesus burned in hell. That's the point I'm making. So let's leave it there, Brandon. You want to believe that? You'll answer to Jesus Christ, your Lord. Keep it to yourself. Don't preach it to us. Yeah, see how convenient now it's symbolic. See, when Jonah doesn't fit your teaching, you have to now allegorize it to make it fit. Exactly what I said you were going to do. 
Brendan, I'm not your judge, man. Can we keep on the topic? See, you're distracting me, brother. Is that what you're coming here to do? To debate me on this topic? Or do you want me to address questions that will be beneficial to all and not focus on one of your pet doctrines that is not shared by many Christians? I'm not saying that makes your doctrine wrong. But I'm saying let's focus on the things that we can all agree upon across the board. How about that, friend? What do you think? You think that would be more beneficial instead of making it about your pet doctrines or defending Stephen Anderson? Okay, Eli, so you got it, right? Jesus can be the angel of God the Father because angel simply means messenger. Even though he's not a creature, he's God who became flesh. So you got it now? Clear? Clear, my friend? Do you want to make sure? Um, I keep saying Eli or it could be Ellie. I don't know. Okay, where's Warrior Woman? Warrior Woman. I didn't finish Malachi 3-1 one, uh, one yet. Poor brother has been waiting, RK. Mala. Okay, hold on. Warrior Woman. You're a warrior, warrior woman. You look like Tatiana. Are you the same same as Tatiana? All right. You change your name now? All right. Okay, coming back to Malachi 3-1. It says God is going to send a human angel, a messenger, to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Okay, let me post the link again. That's Malachi 3.1. I want everyone to look at Malachi 3.1. I want you to see that the words, the Lord, the Lord, you're going to see that the word for Lord is not all capitals. It's capital L, lowercase o, Lowercase r, lowercase d. Now let me take some time to unpack the significance of this in your translations. The word, the Hebrew, well, it, obviously the Old Testament is written Hebrew parts of it, Aramaic. God's covenant name, according to the Hebrew Bible, is Yahovah, represented by the four consonant, consonants of the Hebrew <clears throat> language, yod He, vav He. Some will pronounce it wow. Yod he wow he. Yod he wow he or yod he vav he. That name appears approximately 7,000 times in reference to the one true God of all creation, the God of Israel, right? Yod he vav he or yod he wow he. Y H W H Y H V H. Okay. You can pronounce it Yahweh. I'm actually led to believe because of the studies of Nehemiah Gordon. That the proper pronunciation is Yahovah, something known to the rabbis till this day. The rabbis know this. They never forgot the pronunciation of the name. They just kept it hidden from outsiders, right? Yahovah. Did you know that? I highly recommend reading the books or watching the videos by Nehemiah Gordon. I guess he pronounced it Nehemiah Gordon, who's not a Jewish believer in Jesus. He's a Karite Jew, and he discovered that the rabbis have always known the proper pronunciation of the divine name, and he documents from Jewish sources, medieval sources, even modern rabbinic scholarly sources, that the name is pronounced Yahovah, so that the rabbis have always known the correct pronunciation. They just kept it hidden from outsiders. Did you know that? So it is a myth. And it's a misunderstanding to say that Jews forgot the pronunciation of the name. No, they kept it to themselves. They left it something mysterious and only revealed it to initiates, to, you know, a top rabbi would pass it on to one of his top students. And he's provided evidence from Jewish sources, both from medieval Judaism and modern Judaism, that the name is pronounced Yahovah. Interestingly, that corresponds to Jehovah. Anyway, in English translations, they do not render the name, what's known as the Tetragrammaton, the four consonants, the four letters, yod He vav He. They don't translate it as Yahweh. They don't translate it as Yahovah. They don't translate it Jehovah, with the exception of, the exception of, the New World Translation, which renders it as Jehovah. The American Standard Version, 
which renders it as Jehovah, the New Jerusalem Bible, which renders it as Yahweh, and you may find a few more other English translations, but many, if not most, of the English translations will render God's covenant name, Yahovah, as Lord in all capitals. Are you with me there? So anytime in English, when you see in your English translation of the Old Testament, this is only true of the Old Testament. Only true of the Old Testament. Let me repeat. The divine name does not appear in the Greek New Testament. The 27 books of the New Testament were originally written under inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Koine Greek, the common Greek of that time. The divine name does not appear in the Greek New Testament. This is only true of the Hebrew portions of the Old Testament. Okay, When you look at the Old Testament, I want you to pay attention. Anytime you see the word Lord in all capitals or the word God, all capitals, that's an indication by the translators to you that in the Hebrew, the divine name appears, Yahovah. They're letting you know by putting it in all caps. Here in Hebrew, it's the divine name, the covenant name of God. Did everyone get it? Do you understand that point before I move on to the next point? Yeah, Hades. Notice what Brandon is doing. He's starting a debate on whether Jesus went to hell and ignoring my wishes to stay focused. Now, moderators, you know what to do to this guy, right? Can you send him on his merry way? Okay. Can you send this guy on his merry way? Because he's all about, he's, he's a one-trick pony. It's all about King James only for him. And he's not interested in other topics where he can grow in his knowledge and understanding of the triune God. Coming back here. Okay, now, going back to Malachi 3.1, I want you to pay attention, Malachi 3.1, the word Lord is not all caps. Everyone pay attention to that. Can you now focus on the question that was asked so I can answer thoroughly for the glory of Jesus Christ? There you'll see it's not all caps. It's only capital L, lowercase O-R-D. Do you see it? Do you see it? Malachi 3.1? I want to give you guys a chance to go there and see it. Okay. The reason why is because in the Hebrew, it's the word Adon. Not Adonai. No, RK. It's not Adonai. Adonai is plural. The plural form of Adon. It's Adon. Adon. Actually, it's Ha-Adon. It's the Lord. The Lord. Ha-Adon. Here is something I want you to remember. This exact phrase, the Lord, ha adon, the word adon with the definite article ha, ha adon, is always used only for Jehovah God. The phrase ha adon is never used for anyone other than Jehovah, the true God. One example is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 24. There he's called ha adon, Yehovah, the Lord, Jehovah. You want me there? Ha'adon, Yehovah, the Lord Jehovah. So again, in Malachi 3.1, it says, Ha'adon, the Lord is coming to his temple. That phrase, Ha'adon, not just Adon by itself. Ha'adon, when the definite article appears before Adon, it's only used of Jehovah God. In other words, according to this prophecy, the Lord, Ha'adon, who's coming, is Jehovah God. Further proof that it's referring to Jehovah God appearing to his people. It says, then suddenly the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple. His temple. According to 1 Chronicles 29 verse 1. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 1. The temple in Jerusalem was not built for man. It was built for God. Let me give you the verse. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 1. I'm going to read it. You can note it. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is yet young and tender. And the work is great. For the palace, the temple, is not for man, but for Yahovah Elohim, the Lord God. Okay. Do you understand the implication of that? 
Malachi 3 1 says, Ha Adon, a phrase that's only used of Jehovah, will come to his temple, the temple in Jerusalem. According to the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1 specifically, that temple in Jerusalem is built only for Jehovah, for God, not for man. In other words, what Malachi 3 1 is saying is that this human messenger is preparing people. For the coming of Jehovah God Almighty to his temple in Jerusalem. Did everyone got it? Before I move on? RK? Okay. Here's the question. Now, if someone's confused, put a two. Manchester, you didn't get it? You said no. Before I move on. Yeah, I will do that, Avinash. Just be patient with me, my friend. Just I can only answer one at a time. I can't answer 5,000. Okay. Yeah, that part you didn't get. When you see the word Lord in all capitals, that means that in the Hebrew it's Yahovah. Ha Adon. Is the phrase or the words used in Malachi 3 1? It doesn't say Yahovah is coming, it says Ha Adon is coming, the Lord. But how do we know that Lord is Jehovah? Because the phrase Ha Adon, the Lord, is only used of Jehovah. And secondly, that Lord who's coming is coming to his temple. The temple belongs to him. Which temple? The temple in Jerusalem. And I just showed you the temple in Jerusalem is built for Jehovah. So although the word Jehovah is not used of him, nonetheless, it is Jehovah who's coming. That's the point I'm trying to establish. Okay, is that clear now? Yep, warrior. Ha'adon is coming to his temple in Jerusalem. Ha'adon, those words, that phrase, only use of Jehovah, and the temple... Belongs to Jehovah alone. Therefore, that Lord must be Jehovah. That's the point. Saved by grace. That's not the question he asked. He asked me, not whether Jesus Christ has existed in eternity before creation, but did he exist as the Son of God before creation? Right? But you go on to clarify that point by saying he didn't become the Son of God. He was always who he was. The debate is not whether Jesus is an eternal divine person saved by grace. The debate is, even though he's an eternal divine person, uncreated, eternally existing with the Father and the Spirit, did he always exist as the Son, or did he become the Son in a moment of time? Now, I agree with you, say by grace, he's always been the Son, one with the Father and the Spirit, even in eternity before creation. But I'll get to that in a moment. Everyone else, you got the point of Malachi 3.1? Malachi 3.1? Yes, because I want to move on to its relevance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now here's where it's going to be relevant for all of us in our witness to the deity of Christ. According to Mark 1 verse 2, write these down, folks. Mark chapter 1 verse 2, Matthew chapter 11 verse 10, Matthew chapter 11 verse 10, and Luke 7 verse 27. Mark 1 verse 2, Matthew 11 10, Luke 7 27. The messenger of Malachi 3.1, who was sent to prepare for the Lord, is John the Baptist. In fact, our Lord Jesus Christ himself says that. In Matthew 11.10 and Luke 7.27, our Lord himself says that John the Baptist is he of whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you to prepare your way. So Jesus identifies John the Baptist as that messenger. There's that messenger of Malachi 3.1, John the Baptist. He is the one who is the messenger, the angel, the human angel that Malachi said would be sent to prepare for the Lord. Okay, everyone with me there? So according to our Lord Jesus and Mark, who is the messenger of Malachi 3.1 sent to prepare for the Lord? Who is the messenger? I want to make sure all of you are getting it. No, it doesn't say... Elijah and Malachi 3.1. It says the messenger will be sent. And according to the Lord Jesus and Mark, who is it? Who's the messenger that will be sent? Our case said Jesus. 
RK, thank you for now refuting that Jesus is God. Good job, my friend. Okay, most of you got it. John the Baptist. Good. All right. Now, here's the question. If John the Baptist is that messenger of Malachi 3.1, who would be sent to prepare for Ha'adon, the Lord, who's coming to his temple in Jerusalem, meaning prepare for the coming of Jehovah, according to the New Testament, according to John the Baptist, according to Jesus and his followers, John the Baptist was sent to prepare for the appearance, the coming of Jesus Christ. You hear me there? One example is Acts chapter 19, verse 4. Acts 19, verse 4 says that John the Baptist was sent to prepare for the Christ. Confirmed in John chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Write these passages down because I won't have time to copy and paste. John 1. Oh, thank you for some last. He posted it. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So right there, Acts 19, 4. But also write down John 1, 14 and 15. John 1, 14 and 15. And this is a long one. We're not going to read all of it. 29 to 36. John 1, 29 to 36. Now, first and last, you don't need to quote those. John 1, 29 to 36. Uh, John 1, 19 to 36. Not 29. My, forgive me. John 1. 19 to 36. All these passages, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the apostles affirm John the Baptist was sent to prepare for the coming of Jesus. Everyone got that? So let's see if you got it. The messenger of Malachi 3.1 is John the Baptist. That messenger, John the Baptist, was sent to prepare for the coming of Jehovah. How do we know Jehovah? Because Ha'adon is only used of Jehovah, and that Lord is coming to his temple, and the temple is built for Jehovah. So John the Baptist is preparing the people for the coming of Jehovah God. But the Jehovah that John the Baptist prepared for turns out to be Jesus Christ the Son. In other words, Jesus Christ is the Ha'adon, of Malachi 3.1, and the temple in Jerusalem belongs to Jesus Christ. So Jesus is Jehovah who became flesh, and the temple in Jerusalem is his temple because he's God Almighty, the God of Israel, become flesh. You guys got it? The Muslim reaction to Malachi would be that Malachi is not talking about John the Baptist and it's not talking about Jesus Christ. However, according to John the Baptist's witness, Jesus' own witness, the followers of Jesus in the New Testament, John the Baptist is the messenger of Malachi 3.1, and Jesus is the Lord that John prepared for, and the temple belongs to Jesus because he's Jehovah in the flesh. You got it? But what would they say? They'll say Malachi 3.1 is not about John the Baptist or the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll quote unbelieving Jews to prove the point. Hope that answered that question. Any other questions? I may take one or two more. Let me see what time is it. Yeah. Let's see. Any other questions? No, they can't dispute that, Ani Dixon, because what... The Gospels are doing is making explicit what's implicit in Malachi that the divine being who is coming is distinct from another divine person. In other words, what the New Testament is doing, it's affirming that the God of Israel is multipersonal because one member of the Godhead is sending this messenger to prepare for the coming of the other member of the Godhead. So they can't make that argument. Because Malachi 3.1 is quite clear. The one who is to come, whether you take it as first person singular, right, or third person singular, the one who is to come, I'm sorry, second person singular, the one who is to come is the Lord. There's no getting, getting around it. The one who is to come is the Lord coming to his temple. So they can do what they want, but they're just perverting the text. So the reason why you have a switch in the pronoun, because now you introduced another argument, 
I don't want to lose the people, but you did it, so I'm going to address it, okay? It, what does the pronoun change have to do with, even the pronoun change doesn't refute the fact, Ani, that Malachi 3, 1, it's still the Lord coming to the temple. What does the pronoun change have to do with that fact? Whether you got, want to go that, I will send the messenger prepare for me or for you, right? <clears throat> Second person singular, though you is still the Lord coming to his temple. How does that get around that fact? It doesn't. But the reason why you have a switch in the New Testament from me to you is because the New Testament writers, our Lord Jesus himself, are highlighting the fact that though Jesus is the Lord God, Jehovah, coming to his temple, he's still not identical to the Father. So the Father is one divine person sending another divine person. That's why you have a switch in the pronouns to affirm the multi-personal nature of the God of Israel. Get my point? So, hope that answered that question. How, I mean, man. Okay. They want to say it's corrupted? All right, it's corrupted. All right. Now we go into textual preservation. Any other questions? Someone said, the you is still the Lord. Yeah, exactly, worry woman. Even if you go from, I will send my messenger to prepare the way before me, to I will send my message pre prepare the way before you, still the context, the you there or the me there, is still the Lord coming to his temple. But the question then becomes, why the change in the pronoun? Because the New Testament writers want to make sure, and our Lord wants us to know, that he's not the Father who's coming, but he is the Son of the Father, so that the passage ends up becoming an explicit witness to the fact that the one God of Israel is multi-personal. One divine person sending another divine person after sending a human agent to prepare the coming of that divine person. I don't get what you're asking me, big boy travels. Do you do? Oh, study Bibles? What do you mean study Bibles? Good point, Ani Dixon, because they will bring it up. But that's what you keep hammering. What does that got to do with the fact whether you have me or you, the context is still the same, that you is the Lord coming to his temple. Yeah, I still don't understand the question. What do you mean I do study Bibles? I mean, do I have a written study Bible that I wrote? Or do I teach on the Bible? Do I have Bible studies? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. That's what I've been doing since 1999. I teach the Bible. And I have many of my sessions on my YouTube page, Shemunian. But I'm going to change the name, Answering Islam, because people don't know Shemunian is me. That's why I don't have too many subscribers. I don't have as many as CP and David Wood. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you'll find a lot of my teachings on my own page, Shemunian. And I've written over 200 articles on the websites that I contribute for by the grace of God. Yeah, well, because as I began my discussion, Big Boy Travels, for the past year I've been going – through a major satanic attack on my family. And it's already public, and I have to go public because I'm a public figure, a minister of the Lord. Uh, I got officially divorced November 28th, right? My now ex-wife served me divorce papers, and I, you know, again, I'm not trying to put her down, but I have to be, you know. Unfortunately, Satan came in, and she slipped into marital unfaithfulness. So keep praying for her restoration and pray that I can control myself and be Christ to her. Pray that the Lord will give me the holiness to delight his heart, the health I need to raise up my children, to protect my children from this massive attack on our family. And the Lord Jesus deliver me out of a verdict from a very corrupt judge that can stop me from doing ministry. But God is good. Christ is alive. And as long as the Holy Spirit seals us and fills us for the glory of Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors by the blood of Jesus. So keep praying. Okay, let's get to the question. Any questions? And by the way, her name is Michelle. Pray for her. That God will have mercy on her. And my two angels, Sarai and Zipporah. Sullivan, I don't want to talk too much about her now because, remember, I'm recording this. People are going to watch it. And you know my enemies, Muslims and those who profess to be Christian, who out of their hatred towards me, 
right, will use this to attack me and discount me. You you answer the question. You you answer the question. Someone who falls away, not once but twice, right? Sexual morality. You tell me whether they're saved or not. I'll let you be the judge. But let's focus on this because I'm not here to attack her. Really, I don't want to because she's still the mother of my kids and she's someone that Jesus died for. So pray for her salvation if she's not or her restoration. Of course, Christian McDonald, I do believe in the Trinity. That's what I've been arguing for the past 40 minutes. But what specific question do you have related to the Trinity? I will, Ani. Uh, the only problem is I was sidetracked for a year because of this major battle. Ani, put it this way. Because of this sin, I was left virtually homeless. I had to stay with a brother in the Lord in his garage that he converted into an apartment. And now with my biological brother, who's let me stay here until I get out of this trial, get on my feet financially by the grace of God, so I can then have a place for my daughters. So I was virtually homeless. But glory to Jesus Christ by way of testimony real quickly. God has been ever more closer to me in this past year of my trial. I have seen God do some miraculous things, some miraculous divine appointments that defy logic. So God has showed up in a miraculous way and has sustained me, even though there are times where I've gotten angry and very depressed. He has saved me, sustained me, and he's continuing to save me for his glory, not because I'm worthy, but because he's faithful, right? So we pray that he shows up for my family, my daughters, protects them and their mother for the glory of Jesus. Because although my marriage ended, that doesn't mean she's not precious. She's precious to Jesus because he died for her and he created her for his glory. Ask the Lord Jesus to save her and keep my daughters healthy for his glory. So with that said, let's come back. Let's focus. Let's focus. <clears throat> and pray I can be Christer because it's hard, I'll be honest with you. It is very hard because of what I went through. But Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen. He's almighty to save. And we're covered by his blood. Okay, let's come to the questions. Love you, Sam. I'm going to start. Hey, Hazakim, how am I looking, brother? Do I look a little smaller than before? Still got 50 pounds, player. Pray. Glory to God. I went from 330 down to 250. I want to go down to 220, and I will do it by his grace. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. All right. Any questions? Come on, guys. Ask me a question. Let's see. Someone asked what you have lost. Yes, I have, Rambo. I went from 330 down to 250. I need to go down to 220 by the grace of God. I got to get my health and my life back for the glory of Jesus. Okay, John 14, 23. Uh, what do you want me to what, – what specifically do you want me to just about John 14, 23? Yes, amen. Saved by grace. Thank you, saving reaction. Keep praying for me because now I have to await a verdict. If this verdict doesn't does not come back positively, it can tank me financially where I can be homeless. So pray for, for the Lord to show up and to stir parts to contribute financially to the ministry if you believe God has called me to ministry. Okay, Revelation 1 1. But hold on, someone asked me about hey Jessica, how are you, sister? God bless you. Yeah, oh boy, you're asking a very complex uh, question. Why don't we do this, Jessica? Let me save that for our bi-monthly Bible study. Let us let me do it there. Oh, you better believe Illinois courts suck. And the judge I have, she's a man-eater, destroys men. But Jesus Christ is greater than her. She will bow before him. Okay, John 14, 23. Okay, I'm going to do Hebrews 1, 4. All right, let's do Hebrews 1, 4. All right. I was waiting for John 14, 23. Hebrews 1, 4. Okay, this is going to kill two birds with one stone. Did Jesus Christ become the Son of God, or has he always been the Son of God? It depends, Islamic engineer. If you're here to attack, don't waste your time with me. If you're going to ask a sincere question, I'll answer it. But if you're trying to stump me, stump the chump, don't waste your time with me. I will entertain genuine questions by Muslims who honestly seek. Okay? All right. Are you asking sincerely or no? Because that's one of the canards, one of the pathetic arguments of Adnan Rashid, who's a joke. No disrespect to your Muslim apologist. He is a joke. But I'll answer the questions. Since Islamic engineer asked me a question, oh, why do you call yourself Islamic engineer, dude? Here, I'm, this, this guy just false advertisement. Here I'm thinking he's a Muslim wants to attack. 
Islamic engineer? All right. Okay. I'm going to answer two questions tonight. And God willing, if you're praying for me, God, give me the health I need, the holiness to delight his heart, to protect my children, provide financially. I'll be doing this regularly now. I'm coming back on. This is my first time back in about, what, over eight months? I want to do this regularly, and I will. Okay, Islamic engineer, two questions I'm going to take. I'm going to take his question. Let's go and thank our brother first to last. He's going to post it. Post for us. Luke 23, <clears throat> 43. Luke 23, 43. Okay. Luke 23, 43. Okay, if you can. If not, all right. Jesus Christ, our Lord, said to the thief on the cross, Truly I say unto thee. He posted it. Thank you. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Okay, however, John 20, 17, Jesus Christ, our Lord, physically raised from the dead, alive in his physical body, now made immortal, tells Mary Magdalene, stop clinging to me. Do not cling to me, for I've yet ascended to my father. But go and tell my brethren, I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. Okay, now here's the question. Jesus said on that very day, when he was hanging on the cross, the thief would be with him in paradise. But hold on. Three days later, after his physical resurrection from the dead, he's telling Mary Magdalene, I have yet to ascend to my father. How do we reconcile this contradiction? It's, it is such a laughable contradiction. The very fact that Adnan Rashid brought it up shows that he must be a world-class ignoramus. Sorry to be blunt, or a world class deceiver like the God he worships, who says that he is Khairul Makarin, the best of all deceivers. Why? Where's the problem? Islamic engineer, when Jesus physically died, do you not believe, like even Muslims believe, that his soul, his human soul, his human spirit left his body? Though physically he's in the tomb, what do we believe about death? And Muslims believe the same thing. Let me give you the references. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 154, Surah Al-Baqarah, 154, and chapter 3, Surah Al-Imran, 169 to 170, right, says that those who are killed in the way of Allah do not say they are dead. They're alive with their Lord, receiving provision from Him. The martyrs are alive. Well, wait, they're physically dead. What do you mean alive? Well, their souls leave their bodies. Okay, so here's my question, Islamic engineer. That day when Jesus died, don't you believe that his human spirit, his human soul, left his body? Although his body was in the tomb? Don't you believe that? I know some people leave in soul sleep. I don't believe that. It's not scriptural. I will in a minute, Belina. Just one second. Do you, right, Islamic engineer? And you need to respond because I'm answering for you. Didn't his soul, his spirit leave his body? Okay. So he was with that man in paradise as a disembodied spirit. He was there in his human spirit with that man because that man would have went there as a spirit too, not physically. But when he physically rose from the dead, he was telling Mary Magdalene, I have yet to physically ascend to the Father. Where is the problem? In Luke 23, he was with him on that day in his spirit as the rich man. Well, rich man, I'm sorry. The thief would have also been there in his spirit. His body and Jesus' body died, would have been buried. But as disembodied spirits, their human spirits, human souls would have been in paradise. But when Jesus then returned to his physical body and rose physically on that day, the third day, Physically, he had yet to ascend into heaven. What's the problem? Where's the problem? Thank you, warrior woman. You truly are a warrior. Uh, you got it now? So yes, he was with that criminal, that man, the day he died in paradise, as a disembodied spirit, body buried, 
but still alive in his human spirit, his human soul, as that man would have been alive in his spiritual form. However, when he rose physically and Mary Magdalene was clinging to him, he had yet to ascend physically to the Father. There's no contradiction. To even bring this up shows how desperate Muslims like Adnan Rashid happened to be. Did I answer your question? To answer your question before I move on to Hebrews 1, 4 to 5. <clears throat> Okay, then, all right, good. Everyone with me, right? You're not confused with my response to how could Jesus say on the day he died, today I, you'll be with me in paradise. And then on the third day, when he was raised from the dead, he tells Mary Magdalene, I've yet to send to the Father. That again assumes that by paradise, he's talking about God's heavenly presence where angels dwell and not the paradise of Sheol. Won't get into that, not relevant, because the answer I gave is sufficient to refute this canard. Okay, now coming back to the issue of Hebrews 1, 4 to 5. Let's post Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. And thank our brother first and last for helping us. It's been a while. Lord willing, I think I'm just going to do live stream on YouTube. And I think my days in Paltak are over unless I combine both of them. We'll see as the Lord leads. Interestingly, my ex-wife's name is Michelle. Anyway, Hebrews 1, 4 to 5. Now, let me read it, and now I'm going to bring the objection. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Let me get one second. I got to get the charger for the computer. It's going to die. One second. Sorry, guys. One second. Keep them entertained for some last. All right. Let's see where it is. Don't hate. I know you guys are haters. Like, man, what's up? And no. All right. Yeah, guys, if you're interested in helping me to stay in ministry by supporting me financially, do contact me on Facebook or email. If you want a tax receipt, I'll tell you how to do that. If you just want to contribute and don't care about that, I'll let you know because it will really help. It will really help me to stay in ministry, especially in this trial that I'm going through by the grace of God. All right. Anyway, let's come back to and subscribe to my page, by the way. And pass it on to others. Let's build up for the glory of Christ. Let's come back to the passages. And let me explain the issues. There are two issues involved here. Number one, it says Jesus was made better than the angels. How could he be made better than the angels if he's God by nature and is always superior to them? My email would be sam.shmn sam .shmn at gmail.com. S H M N at gmail.com. So it's my name, Sam Shamoon, but Sam dot S H M N at gmail.com. Anyway, coming back to the issue, how could Jesus become superior to the angels if he's already superior to them by virtue of being God? That's the first objection. Secondly, it says that Jesus obtained the name Son of God after he ascended into heaven. In other words, if you read Hebrews 1, specifically 3 to 5, the impression given is that Jesus becomes God's son after he ascends to heaven and sits at God's throne, upon God's throne. You with me there? These are the two objections. Hebrews 1.3, after he made a purging of our sins, after he purged our sins all by himself, he then sat at the right hand on the majesty of the majesty on high. He sat at the right hand of the majesty on high. And that's when he became superior to angels and received the name son. So these are the objections, right? Does everyone get the objection? So I can answer Hebrews 1, 4, and 5 
thoroughly by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's someone confused, put a two. Okay. If you got it, let's explain. All right. How could Jesus become superior to the angels? Very simply, uh, simp uh, simply stated. Because when he came to the earth, he took the status of a slave and set aside his divine rights as king. In other words, he went from being the king of all creation, seated on God's throne, to making himself a nothing on earth, taking a status that made him lower than the angels in position, positionally, by coming to the earth to become flesh and assuming the status of a slave servant. How do we know this? Let's go to Hebrews 2, 6 to 9. Hebrews 2, 6 to 9. Hebrews 2, 6 to 9. And thank our friend and brother first and last for posting. But one in a certain place testified. Notice what Hebrews is going to say here. <clears throat> what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him, that you visit him because you care for him? Thou madest him, you made man, a little lower than the angels. Did you catch it? Because of the fall of Adam and Eve, we are now lower than, in position and glory in comparison to the angels because of the fall of Adam and Eve we become lower positionally right than the angels lower in status and glory right thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands now watch this thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet God has made man the crown of his creation the king of his creation for in that he put all in subjection under him, man. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. We still do not see the world under the subjection of believers. The men and women that God has glorified. Because we see the world still under influence of Satan and his children persecuting believers. But now how do we know that this world and even angels will be subject to us? How do we know this? Here's how we know, Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That's how we know. Did you catch it? Jesus, for a season and for a reason, was made lower than the angels so he could die for us. So when he came to earth as a man to die for us, he took our lowly status our state of humiliation, the status that all human beings share in common because of the fall that makes us less than angels, he voluntarily took that status and made himself voluntarily less than angels in position, even though he's still their Lord and Creator, voluntarily, willfully, to die for us, to redeem us, in order to exalt us above angels again. That's what Hebrews 1.4 is saying if you read it in context. The one who is the creator of angels, God Almighty, one with the Father, made himself lower than the angels for a season and for a reason to die for us so that now he can exalt us in union with him above them in status and glory. With me there? Did you catch that part? That's the price that Jesus voluntarily paid out of his infinite love for us. Right? Thank you, Christian McDonald. You got it. Your response showed me you got it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All glory to you. And you, the Father and Son, enabling me and everyone to understand these issues for the glory of Christ. Okay, now. Now we answer that. So why did he become superior to them? Because he had the status of God, King of creation. He put aside that status. He didn't cease being God. He was still God, but he set aside his status as God, took the status of a servant with us, making himself lower in status and glory and position to the angels whom he created, whom he owns. And then after the resurrection, after he paid the price for our redemption, then was exalted above them again, seated with the Father on the same throne in heaven, so that because of his exaltation, because remember, when Jesus came down, he came down as spirit who became flesh. 
When he went up, he went up as spirit who is now flesh, as the God-man. He came down as God to become man and went back up as the God-man. So right now on the throne, it's not simply Jesus as God ruling. He is ruling as the God-man. And in his humanity, he represents us in his exaltation above angels. Because he's a man in solidarity with us, in union with us, and as a man, he's been exalted above the angels, that guarantees that's our destiny. We too will share in his status, even though we'll still be beneath him, a status that will make us greater than angels again. Yep, that's why it's called Son of Man, to identify with us. And he'll forever remain God, man. Amen. He won't stop. So everyone got that? Hallelujah. Everyone got that? Well, you can't give me a question right now. I got to deal with this. And I may not have time for Revelation 22, 3, because it's already one, one hour, 30 minutes. Now, what about him becoming the son of God? Okay. There are two senses, two senses, at least two senses, as the Lord Jesus lo loosens my tongue because I got a bad list. Uh, fucker, fucker tap. All right. Two senses in which Jesus is God's son. Okay. Two ways in which he's the son of God. He is the son of God by nature, meaning as a divine person, he is the eternal son, one with the father, even from before creation. But then he becomes the son of God in a different sense in a different way, in a different manner. What do I mean? As God, he's the eternal son, always been the son. And as the son, the father used him to create everything. It is the son as the son that created everything. Let's go to Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. Let me show you that. So there's two ways in which Jesus is the son of God. The son of God by nature, as God, he's the eternal son always existing with the Father before creation. And as the divine Son, he created all things. Here it is, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Here's the proof. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now watch. Hath in these last days spoken to us unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He made the worlds... The ages and everything contained therein by whom? The Son. The Son was used by the Father to make all creation. All the ages and everything contained therein. Well, for the Son to have created all the ages, that means the Son existed before all the ages. Right? Now notice verse 3 what it says about the Son. Who, the Son, being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty and I. So notice, the Son sustains all creation. The Son created all the ages and everything contained therein. For the Son to have created the entire cosmos, all of creation, all the ages and everything included therein, he must have existed as the son before creation. Right? So the answer to the question, has Christ always been the son? Yes. So as a divine person, as an eternal person, an uncreated person, he's always been the divine son of God. But there's another sense in which he becomes the son of God. Okay? Let's go to Hebrews 1.5. Let me show you. What do I mean? Hebrews 1 5. The Son has always been there as the Son, but there's a sense in which He becomes God's Son, right? Because the term Son of God can mean different things in different contexts. Yep, there is. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Just be patient, friend. Hebrews 1 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, in the context of saying, when Jesus became superior to the angels, he received the name superior to theirs. What name was Jesus given when he ascended to heaven? Son of God. And that is a name that 
God has not given to any angel. Now, here's where it gets baffling and confusing. Uh, unless you're Stephen Anderson, who misinterprets this passage to prove that angels are not called son, sons of God. If you go to Job 38, verse 7, Job, here comes this guy. Sai Christian. Anyway, if you go to Job 38, verse 7, if you go there, there, spirit beings who existed before the earth was created are called the sons of God. Job 38, verse 7. This is talking about the creation of the earth. If you don't believe me, let's read it from 4 to 7. Let's read 4 to 7. Thank you for the last. Hey, Martin, what's up? Watch here. Hebrews, I'm sorry, Job 38, 4 to 7. Watch here. Tani, tani. Job 38, verse 4 to 7. Thank first last he's going to post it. Where wast thou? Notice what God is talking about. The laying of the foundation of the earth. He's talking to Job. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Job obviously can't answer that. He wasn't there. Who hath laid the measure thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations thereof fa fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Can I ask you a question? Who are the sons of God who rejoiced when they saw God create the earth when there was no man yet? <laughs> there was no man when God laid the foundation of the earth. Man came later. So who are these sons of God who rejoiced at seeing God, their creator, create the earth? Okay, don't ask me. Tell me. Who are the sons of God that rejoiced when they saw God create the earth? Folks, if there are no human beings, no animals, you're only off with one answer. The spirit creatures of heaven, the heavenly beings, angels. You got it? So here angels are called sons of God. But hold on. Hebrews 1.5 says, God has never called an angel his son. Do we have a contradiction? No, we don't. Let's go back to Hebrews 1.5 to see what Hebrews says about angels being called the son of God. For unto which of the angels said he at any time? In other words, the... The question expects a negative answer. He's never said it to any angel. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So this question expects a negative answer. God has never said to any angel, you are my son. But Job 38, 7, all the angels are called God's sons. Do we have a contradiction? Do we have a contradiction? No, we don't. Remember I said the term son of God can mean different things in different contexts. In Job 38, 7, they're called the sons of God because they are spirit creatures whom God created, whom God sustains, whom God empowers to dwell in his presence. In Hebrews 1, 5, the term son of God has a different meaning. In Hebrews 1, 5, Son of God there has a different meaning from the term sons of God in Job 38, 7. What does it mean in Hebrews 1, 5 to be a son of God? You don't need to guess. All you need to do is identify the citations. Because in Hebrews 1, 5, the inspired author, which tradition says is Paul, and I have no reason to deny it, Paul, the beloved apostle of our Lord, is citing two Old Testament texts, both of which refer to the kings of Israel. In Psalm 2, 7, the first citation, it's referring to the day in which the king of Israel takes the throne to rule. Psalm 2, 6 to 7. Let's see. Psalm 2, 6 to 7. 6 and 7. Say by grace. I hope you're not saying no to me. Uh, well, maybe it's still a few other questions. Notice, read with me. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the, de declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Did you catch it? 
It's talking about the coronation of the king of Israel. The day in which the king takes the throne to rule Israel, that's the day that God says, now you're my son and I'm your father. You see what Hebrews 1.5 is quoting? Hebrews 1.5 is quoting this psalm. But he quotes another text. I will be his father, he'll be my son. That's 2 Samuel 7, verse 14. We're going to look at 14 and 15. 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15. Exactly, saved by grace. 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15. God is telling David, I'm going to raise up a son from you to build me a house. Notice what he says about the son. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, if he commits sin, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So you see what God is saying, David? David, you won't build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to raise up a son from you. He'll build the house in Jerusalem. That son will be my son. I'll be his father. So you notice the two passages that Hebrews 1 is quoting. It's referring to David and his sons ruling on God's throne on earth. The moment. David and his sons take the throne to rule is the day in which they become God's son in that sense. Okay, say by grace. Thank you. Thank you. Is that clear so far? I don't know how to enable the super chat. I'm learning. So what type of son is Hebrews 1.5 referring to? David and his sons as the heirs of God's throne on earth. What I call royal son of God. The son of God in the sense of being a human being chosen by God to sit on his throne on earth to rule his people Israel. On the day in which you begin to rule is the day in which God takes you as his son. Where as your father he protects you and fights for you against your enemies. Royal son of God. You with me there? Did everyone get it or no? Nargis, I have no idea what you mean. There are no pictures of Christ. What do you mean? All of them are pictures of Christ. Are you talking about a photograph? Okay, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, now, coming back to the issue. If anyone's confused, say, I'm confused. Help me understand. To prove to you that this son that God promised David is referring to Solomon, Go to 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. Okay, sorry, you got me confused. 1 Chronicles 28, 4 to 6. First Chronicles 28, 4 to 6. So I explain what's happening here. Howbeit the Lord God of this is David speaking, by the way. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel. He chose me forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. Now watch this. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons. He had chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Notice 20, uh, verse 6. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. So now, I think I've proven the point. David and his sons were given the right to sit on God's throne on earth over Israel. This was an honor given only to David and his household forever. The day in which David began to rule, Solomon began to rule, Hezekiah began to rule, any of them began to rule, that's the day in which they become God's son. What kind of son? The royal son of God. The human being chosen by God, empowered by God, to sit on God's throne, honor to rule over Israel. And the nations as his representative. You with me there? Is that clear? I'm almost done. I'm going to have to call it quits because my brother's coming in. Do you understand 
This is called royal sonship, the royal son of God. Okay, now, who qualifies to be God's son in that sense? Not everyone can be that kind of son of God. Number one, to qualify to be this kind of son, you must be a physical descendant of David. That's number one. Now, let me ask you questions. Do angels who are spirits qualify for this kind of sonship? Can they be this kind of son of God? Can they? To be a royal son of God, you have to be from the physical line of David. Do you see why Hebrews 1.5 said, God never said this to any angel? Do you know it makes sense, doesn't it? That shows you the author knows the Bible much better than we think. God has never told an angel, be this kind of son to me. I will be this kind of father to you. Because no angel was allowed to rule on David's throne on earth. So they cannot be that kind of son of God. You get it? Does it make sense now? They cannot be that kind of son of God. So there is no contradiction. Angels are the sons of God in one sense. Spirit creatures created by God, sustained by God, given life by God, and empowered by God to dwell in his presence and to serve him. So they're sons of God in that sense. But in this kind of sonship, royal son, where you have to be a physical descendant of David, ruling God's throne on earth, no angel could ever qualify, which is why God never said it to any angel. Making sense? Before I move on to the next point. Not only must you be the physical son of David, you must be the heir to David's throne because David had many sons, but only one of them would be chosen to sit on God's uh, on David's throne on earth. So you have to be a physical son of David and the heir to the throne. And you would have to begin ruling on that throne. So these are the three criteria. A physical son of David, the heir to David's throne, and then begin ruling on the throne. The day in which you begin ruling, that's when you become God's son. Now, let me ask you a question. When did Jesus qualify to be this kind of son of God? Before he became flesh, as God, he's spirit. Did he qualify before he became flesh? Did he qualify before he became flesh? Before he became flesh, was he qualified to be this kind of son? No, fainting, Lila, you're not listening to me then. How can he qualify to be the royal son of God when you have to be a physical son of David? Then you're not listening. So before he became flesh, was he qualified? No. When did he qualify? When he became flesh from his blessed virgin mother in the power of the Holy Spirit, who was of the line of David. Only when he became a physical descent of David that was the first part of the criteria. The second part of the criteria, he had to be the heir to David's throne. And thirdly, he had to start ruling the throne as a son of David. So here's my question. When did Jesus begin ruling the throne as a son of David? It's okay, see you. They can't see you. At the what? They can't see you. No, not after baptism. No. To be the royal son of God, you must begin ruling the throne. When did Jesus begin ruling the throne as the son of David? John R., you got it. After his resurrection and ascension into heaven, because he returned to heaven as the son of David, not just the son of God. So as the human son of David, when he entered heaven, he sat on the throne. That's when he becomes God's son in that sense. That's why Hebrews 1 says, Jesus inherited that name, son of God, after he went to heaven. Because that's when he becomes the Davidic son of God, the royal son of God. Although he's always been the divine son, he only becomes the Davidic son of God after he becomes flesh from the line of David and then enters heaven as a son of David to sit on God's throne in heaven as a son of David. So you see why Hebrews 1 can say Jesus becomes the son of God at that point, a type of son that's not true of any angel because no angel could qualify to be that kind of son of God. 
Because to be that kind of son of God, you have to be a physical son of David, the heir of his throne, and start ruling the throne as a son of David? Yep, it was planned in eternity before creation. Yes, saved by grace. And I'll explain that in a future session why. I'll explain why this was planned. Because God had intended all along to be the sole king of Israel. If you actually read 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the Israelites asked for a human king, it broke the heart of Samuel and broke the heart of God. Because God said, they didn't reject you, Samuel, they're rejecting me. Though I wanted to be their king, but give them what they want. They want a human king like the other nations, right? Then I'll give them one. So what God did, he condescended to the level of the Israelites. Gave them what they wanted in their sinful heart, a human ruler. But then guess what he does? Since God wants to be the only king of Israel, he then kills two birds with one stone. He then becomes a human being to give them a physical king. And yet he's still God who rules over Israel. So this is the whole theme of the Bible. That God becomes the human king that Israel desired so that he alone can be king over Israel and not someone else. That's the story of the Bible. You didn't want me to be king because you wanted a human king like the nations. Okay. But my heart is that I alone am your king and become your king. So guess what I'm going to do for you, Israel? I'm going to be the human king that you desire so that as God, I'm still your only king. But now you'll have me as a man ruling over you. Clear? So do you see it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So has Jesus always been the Son of God? As the divine Son, yes. But he wasn't always the royal Son. So does he become the royal Son of God? Yes, when he becomes the Son of David. And as a Son of David, sits on the throne in heaven as a human representative of David. Now, did God ever confer that kind of sonship on any angel? Did he grant that kind of sonship to any angel? I don't know what you mean, yes and no. Because we're talking about the context of created angelic beings. We're not talking about Jesus functioning the role of an angel. So you see Hebrews 1 makes perfect sense. There is no contradiction in Hebrews. It just shows how ignorant we are of the Old Testament so that the author of Hebrews, because of the wisdom given to him by the Holy Spirit, saw things that we do not see. So we think he's wrong when in reality he's more right than you can think. And imagine. You catch it? So is Jesus ruling the throne in heaven as the physical son of David, thereby qualifying to be that kind of son of God, the royal son of God. Yeah, Revelation 22, 16. Let's go to Revelation 22, 16. Let's read it. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, pay attention. He's in heaven now. Glorify with a glorified physical body. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Now watch. I am, present tense, not I was. I am the root and the offspring of David. Bam. I am the son of David right now in heaven on the throne and the bright and morning star. Who caught it? I am the offspring. The physical son of David right now in heaven as we speak, John. So wait, Jesus, aren't you on the throne in heaven? Yes. And yet you're on the throne as the physical son of David? Yes. So you're telling me you're ruling heaven's throne as the God man? Yes. So as God, you're the eternal son of the father. But as man, you become the royal son of the father because you become the son of David? Yes. I'm the son of God in two senses. By virtue of my divine nature, I'm the eternal son. By virtue of my human nature, I'm the royal son. See? Makes sense, doesn't it? Is it clear? So, let's do this, guys. Let's do this. 
I've been here for almost two hours. Lord willing, I'll be back on Wednesday. Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But here's what I need you guys to do for me now. I'm still not out of the fire. I really need you guys to pray for my lawyer by the grace of God to fight for me because I need to be delivered from a verdict that will tank me financially. I need God's miraculous provision to do ministry, take care of my girls, and to save me from an unjust verdict so that I can have money to start my life and do ministry. If the verdict goes against me, I'm going to have to stop because I won't be able to afford remaining in ministry. So my question to every one of you is, do you truly believe, and I don't want you to just say it to say it, do you truly believe God has called me to do full-time ministry for the glory of Christ? <clears throat> yes, because we have a corrupt system, Rambo. Especially in Illinois, it's the worst. Do you guys believe that? If you believe that, then I need you to pray for me, and I need you to consider standing with me financially to do ministry. And if you want to contact me how to do it, contact me via email, sam.shmn at gmail.com. Of course, Jacob Jack, your name says it all, right? But I don't really care for your opinion. Unless it's positive, then I care for it. I love you, Jacob Jack. <laughs> Jack in the box, baby. Just kidding. All right. Yeah, you can do Patreon or you can do PayPal. Or if you need a tax receipt, you have to go through the center. It's up to you, but I need regular income coming in to do it. Look, I don't do it for money. You guys know it. I'm not here to get rich. If I was going to do something to get money, it wouldn't be ministry. But at the same time, the labor is worthy of his wages. So if you believe God has called me to this, Prayerfully consider standing up, standing with me with my children, because this is so far the worst attack on my ministry. And it's taken over a year for me to get out of it. I expect worse attacks in the future, but for now, this has been the worst thus far. And yet Jesus is so good and faithful, he's covering me by his blood and he's protecting me and my children. Fight hard for me by praying and fasting for me and my two daughters for the conviction of their mother to repent and give this battle up. Because she's going to lose if she's fighting the Lord. And that God will sustain me. And also, I want you to pray for my older brother, Salim. God bless his heart. He's put up with me for about now four or five months in a one-bedroom apartment. Doesn't charge me a dime because he knows my struggles. And he's in complete support of me doing ministry. He doesn't pester me to go find a nine-to-five job because he trusts this is what God has called me to do. So can you pray for him? He's going through his own hardship, that God will have mercy on him and save him and provide for him. His name is Salim, Sal, my older brother. I'm the youngest of six, the best looking of them. And pray for my health to lose more weight and stay holy. And pray for my angels, Sarai and Zippor, and pray for their mother, Michelle. God have mercy. Lord willing, I'll be back on Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because I want to get back into the groove of things, do more shows for my YouTube channel. Let's blow it up for the glory of Christ. Hey. If David Wood can have over 100,000 subscribers and CP's getting tens of thousands, hey, I can do it too. I'm better looking than those chumps. No, I love them. God bless them. Jessica, I'll see you soon, sister. I hope you were blessed. By the way, without giving you too much details, I teach a local Bible study bi-monthly at Jessica's church. I'm blessed to see her and her hubby and the members. They're beautiful <clears throat> Christian family. God bless them. Hope you guys were blessed and you learned a lot. Come back Wednesday with your questions. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Jesus. So please pray for me. I need a miracle, guys. I'm telling you, it's serious. If the Lord allows this verdict to be negative, that's it. It's over with. But I'm trusting he won't allow it because he fights for me and my children. I love you guys. And Christ loves you. Yep, in Illinois. Illinois, man, if you live in Illinois, don't get married. Be a monk. That's all I can tell you. We love you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Take care. Yep, contact me there. Sam.shmn at gmail.com. First and last, I love you, bro. Show up Wednesday because I can use you and need you for the glory of Christ. Take care.